Hey everybody, <clears throat> Brian from Witch Doctor. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, doing a series of tests on tuners. It's been a uh, vigorously debated topic as of late. Some of you may have seen uh, tuner testing done in uh, Brian Litz's new book and uh, may have drawn some conclusions from that. Um, definitely a very comprehensive tests of a couple different tuners using a few different rifles, uh, mostly tactical style in nature. So what I wanted to do was actually conduct tuner testing with F-class style rigs and bench rest style um, using the tuner instructions uh, from manufacturers. Um, in some cases, manufacturers don't necessarily have instructions but there's some guidelines that you can look at to help guide how you're gonna do your testing. Uh, there's a, a article, a drop shot and precision rifleman with some good information that I've reviewed. Some other stuff that you can find on accurate shooter, riding the wave, a Bucky's rubber tuner, um, and some various other things to look at to give you some information on tuners. Uh, I convened a little work group on this topic and have been uh, speaking to people on the phone, uh, messaging all kinds of things to gather information about tuners and how they're used and what people believe they can or can't do. And, uh, you know, opinions vary widely. I've heard, you know, stories about tuners performing miracles and um, some people will say, you know, no, they don't. You have to do certain things to get them working right, etc. So a uh, pretty wide variety of ideas out there. But I have been able to come up with some communalities in some of the themes and also put together uh, some testing here to help sort of, you know, figure some of these things out and see what's the deal with the tuners. Okay, so let's look at equipment that is used. This is a Wheeler LRB stock. It's the heavy stock, weighs a ton. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, the action that I've used is a Borden Rimrock BRM XD. Again, I wanted to use more of the F class style for this particular test. I do have a bench rest rifle ready to go for the bench rest testing, but for the F style, I went ahead and used sort of what you may find on the line at like an F open match. Borden Rimrock is uh, arguably the best action uh, for that style of shooting. Also, you see a lot of people using um, thick barrels, a 1.25 inch straight taper. And so I got one of those. Um, and the tuner that we're using here is a Dan Bramley DSB tuner. He offers a couple different types. This one is the wide one. This is the one that you would put on like a 1.25 straight. And he also uses a smaller one that you can use on like a 0.9 or, or 0.8 or something like that. Um, so a couple different tuners. Uh, this one just threads directly on and it has a little, I don't know if you can see it, little O-ring inside of it that helps sort of lock it in place. Uh, what I do is I put a little oil on that O-ring because if you don't, it can get really hard to just turn. But it, it stays in place really well, and in order to turn it, you gotta, you got to put some effort into it to get that thing turned. Okay, and then I went with the March scope, my standard high-power um, scope. It um, has a circle reticle and a dot. And what is great about this scope is literally at, I think it was 40 or 42 power with the targets that I'm using at 100 yards, you can literally at about 42 power, the circle is exactly the same circle as this target and the dot is just about the same size as the dot on target. So, um, very, so basically you have sort of two uh, aiming points. You have your circle and then you have your dot, which made aiming ser significantly easy. Um, the other thing too is I used a heavy front rest. This is the Seb Max and this is a five inch four end on this LRB. So the Max allows for some adjustability. You can have four ends of, of various different uh, widths. I think it may go up to like eight or ten or something like that. But anyway, and then a heavy rear bag using a Lindsay 
that fits with the LRB. The LRB just sits in this thing really good. And so with the free recoil shooting that I was doing, um, once I pushed this thing forward, it usually returned uh, almost perfectly to battery most of the time. So um, really good rigid setup. Also a Flavio trigger. I set those at just about less than an ounce. Um, and I use these Burris XRT rings because they have inserts in them that enable me to shift uh, the scope around and make sure I get all the travel that is needed for windage and elevation. Okay, let's go over components. I got this really good Lapua brass that um, came necturned for the uh, Robinette 30BR chamber that I used for the test. Paul Porosky of PRP Bullets um, neck turned them perfectly. And then also, Paul Porosky provided the bullets for the test, the Voodoo 30 cal Ventress bullets. The ones that I'm using for this test are the 7 Ojive um, 115 grain. There's a couple different types you can get from Paul Porosky PRP Bullets, but um, I went with these ones. Um, it's an 18 twist uh, tube and um, bullets seat nicely in there and went with about four thousandths neck tension on it and the bullet itself is jamming about twenty thousandths jam and the powder i used was n130 i typically use h4198 in this application but it's very hard to find nowadays and i'm on my last eight pounds <laughs> for my um, competition rifle so I went ahead and went with 130 it's it does really well in this application so um, and actually did really good with the testing and I'll show you the data and the groups on that here in a sec the other important piece to this testing is I used wind flags in the field and I used these because actually we had some stormy weather uh, last week in the Pacific Northwest when I was doing load development and doing the first part of the tuner testing and um, it wasn't well there was one day that was super windy and I didn't actually even shoot that day it was too windy um, then there was another day that was very mild you can see the sort of tassels here going a little bit and the flag moving but I only shot when the flags were still so when there was like no wind, that's basically when I actually shot the groups. Um, all right, so I mentioned that Paul Prosky of PRP Bullets sent me a whole bunch of voodoo bullets for this test. He also sent me some dud bullets. Those are bullets that, you know, the bulletsmith like, like Paul decides are not, you know, quality enough to be match grade for whatever reason. Maybe the seating pressure was off or something. Um, was odd about it and so you know basically you sort those out throw them in a, a bucket and then use them for fowlers or or whatever he sent me a nice bag of those so i i did um fire forming with those bullets but i also started seeing some patterns emerging um, during fire forming that i thought could inform low development so i started getting you know pretty good circular groups here at around 35.4 grains of N130. Um, got some, a little bit of horizontal there in 35.6, 35.8 was pretty good. So anyway, this was very initial low development. Um, one thing about tuners is, that I've basically discovered with, is a lot of people that have used them for years, developed them, um, will tell you that you have to do good load development first. You cannot uh, put in just anything in there and then expect the tuner to create a miraculous group. You actually have to do initial load development and find a good stable load first. So that's kind of key to this testing is that I took the time to make sure that there was a good load developed without even moving the tuner. So I just, I screwed the tuner all the way in um, all the way towards the action and then I started my um, tuning with powder and seating depth. Um, knowing this bullet I knew right away it, about 20 thousandths jam is usually always good. I wasn't sure about the charge because I usually don't use N130 uh, but 
I saw some of a window here growing from 35.4 to 35.8 with that powder using the dud bullets. Um, so after I did this initial fire forming, I took the fire formed cases and loaded within that window 35, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, even 36, and uh, fired five shot groups for each. And I found, you know, pretty good range, uh, pretty good tune window here between 35, 5 and 35, 7. Um, as you can see, 35, 6 was the best. Uh, point of impact was almost the same among these three. Um, even with 35.8, uh, but it seemed like these three had the tightest groups and the point of impact was identical. Notice point of impact here is a little bit higher to the right. So going down to 35.4, I thought, no, I want to get up here with 35.5, 6, and 7 where point of impact is almost the same and the groups are all small. I actually settled on 35.6, which is right in the middle of what I'm going to call the tune window. Okay, so what I ended up doing was set it again. The tuner did not move up until now. So I found a good load. I shot a handful of five shot groups with the 35.6 at 20 thousandths jam. They were all small. Um, and I thought, okay, this is, this is a good load, pretty stable. And then I went about firing three shot groups, turning the tuner one hash mark at a time to see what what am I getting on paper here? What do the group shapes look like? What do the size of the groups look like? And uh, patterns started to emerge in this test. Um, you can see here, I moved the tuner from 30 to, th it started at 30. That was the number on the tuner that was um, closest to the action. Um, I also marked, you can see here, I marked the barrel um, in the place where I was gonna, you know, put the hash mark. Um, and then I started turning it out to 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, etc., All the way up to 38, 39. And then it started back at zero. And then one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I stopped after five because what I discovered was looking at sort of the, what I'll call a sine wave of patterns, like where the point of impact lies, and then also looking at group shape, seemed like something really stable emerged here around zero, one, two, three, where, you know, the point of impact was just about the same. The sine wave sort of flattened out. And then as you go to like four and five, you see the sine wave start to dip upward same thing with here, the sine wave before zero dips upward, whereas zero, one, two, and three had a pretty flat sine wave. Um, and so what I determined from this test was, well, number two seemed to have shot the tightest group. It shot a zero, zero, um, seven, seven, five. Um, super tight group. And so I thought, let's, let's do setting two, and we'll consider that the best setting. And then setting 34, I considered the worst setting um, <laughs> for a couple reasons. One, it was the largest group, which you might be thinking 0.211 is the largest. Wow, that's still small. And it is. But notice there's just a lot of other really small groups. Most of them were in the ones or, you know, really low twos. So, um, yeah, I mean, even though th this is still an acceptable group size, but I thought, okay, this one is the biggest. And the shape of it, you can see, was a lot of vertical. And then you can see where it is in the sine wave here, where this starts dipping down next to it. Um, and then it was right next to one that had um, a lot of horizontal. So that was how I determined that 34 was going to be the quote-unquote worst setting. Okay, so up until now... I was the person that shot the initial load development and the sine wave test. Okay, and both of these, uh, both of these were shot in 36 degree weather, uh, 36 to 38 degree weather with over 80 percent humidity and with the barometric pressure down. For, for this part of the world, 29.53, and I think the other one was 29.6.
So barometric pressure, that's low for around here. Typically we get, you know, 29, eight and above. Most days we'll get 30. The pressure was low because we had a storm. Um, and again, I used wind flag, so I wasn't shooting in, in windy, stormy conditions. It just, there was a storm in the area that brought the barometric pressure down. So that's gonna be important to remember with this test is that um, the initial load development and the sine wave test were shot when the barometric pressure was 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 low okay now i've done my own um weather factor testing and i've actually found that out here and I, I tested this for i think a solid year where i went out and i shot several five shot groups in various weather conditions plotted them all on a um on a correlation um plot and found that all the firing that i did below 29.7 of station pressure or barometric pressure was where the groups opened up a lot. They doubled in size. So above 29.7, the groups were half the size as they were from below 29.7. So there is definitely uh, an impact on precision uh, when it comes to barometric pressure. The lower it is, the, the, the basically um, you get some precision differences. Now, what I was able to do though, is I, I plotted those on a data set and I looked at them and I found that, um, okay, it's 29, below 29.7. I'm getting double the size groups. I had to actually rework the load to get the groups to go down, to shrink back to what they typically were in above 29.7. So that tells me that barometric pressure can definitely impact uh, precision. And so that's definitely a factor to remember. It's going to be important to this test too. Okay, so what I ended up doing, again, this was in low barometric pressure of 29.61, again, 38 degrees, over 80% humidity. I went ahead and fired several five-shot groups. Um, all th oh, I'm sorry, I didn't shoot them. I had a shooter who was blind to the actual tuner setting. I was the one setting the tuner while the shooter was, um, you know, walking around the range or something, and then I would call him back, and then he would sit down get behind the rifle and shoot the groups for me. Um, and so he actually, he didn't really even know what a tuner was. Uh, he's definitely a good group shooter, um, but he's heard of tuners, but he doesn't really know what they do. So he had no idea what the heck I was doing up at the front of the rifle anyway. Um, and, and I told him to walk away every time I, I did anything to the tuner or where I told him I was doing something to the tuner after every five shot group, but he had no idea what I was doing anyway. So I alternated between shooting, um, having him shoot five shot groups with the setting of two and 34. As you can see here, I had him start with two. Then I switched it to 34, back to two, left it at two, switched it back to 34, left at 34, back to two, 34, etc., and had him shoot several five shot groups. Okay. Um, what I found from that is there was a statistically significant difference between the best and the worst setting. The tuner setting two produced an aggregate of. 0.18315 and the tuner setting 34 produced an aggregate of 0.2739 okay um, a pretty pretty big difference when you're looking at you know bench rest and shooting precise groups or f class and you know uh, making you sure you're shooting everything in the 10 ring anyway that was statistically significant at 0 0.003 which is well below the cutoff of 0.05 um, I did look at group shape. Group shape is definitely an important factor when you're looking at tuners. And um, in the worst setting, 55.6% of the shapes for tuner setting 34, the worst, um, were vertical. Like you can see, you know, vertical there. Um, where else? Vertical there. So you can see 34 had a lot of vertical. It actually mimicked quite well the vertical that you see in the initial uh, sine wave test okay and so 55 over half had vertical and only 11 percent had circle um, and then when you look at tuner setting two all of them were shaped in a circle so tuner setting two definitely kept not only the groups really small but also 
um, very circular. Um, and then I also looked at point of impact shift, like from the initial uh, five shot group, did, did POI shift at all from that among the other groups? And um, for 274034 of the worst, 33% um, of the time it didn't shift, um, it, but for tuner setting two, 70% of the time it didn't shift. So for whatever reason, the best tuner setting shoots the smallest groups, keeps them circular, and you tend not to get any point of impact shift. They all uh, seem to have impacted in around the same area. Um, whereas with tuner setting 34, yeah, about 76%. Um, had some some form of point of impact shift okay now here's another interesting result so in the previous analysis it was pretty clear that there was a statistically significant difference between the worst and the best setting days later after the storm moved away I went to the range and I looked at the barometric uh, state I'm sorry the station pressure when I arrived and it was 30.05 so markedly higher than the other testing, which to me indicated that, oh, you know, I'm probably going to have, you know, an out of tune rifle here. Um, if it's if it's that much of a difference uh, in station pressure from one shooting episode to the next, it's it's very likely, given my previous studies on atmospheric effects, that I'm going to have some kind of um, uh, tune issue. And that's actually exactly what happened. When I went and I shot tuner setting two, the groups opened up quite a bit. So I was not able to sort of get the precision that I really wanted out of the rifle with tuner setting two. It was typically shooting in the ones. Again, remember the aggregate for the set of shots that I, that I did before when I compared 34 to to was 0.18315. Now I'm shooting in the mid twos with it. So I went ahead and I, I looked at my previous um, anal sine wave analysis and right next to two was number three which shot a really small group and it had the same POI. So I went ahead and I moved it to three. So I turned the tuner to three to see if I can regain a tune and that didn't seem to work. I was again shooting around, you know, mid to low to mid twos. And then I noticed, okay, well, one and zero actually did pretty good. So I shifted it over. I turned the tuner over to one and bam, it started just hammering. <laughs> um, and so basically what I got was um, when I compared tuner setting two to tuner setting one, I saw a statistically significant difference that was um, ha had a probability of below 0.05. Um, so that told me that turning the tuner one hash brought the tune back um, because I was statistically significantly smaller in group size. And that was 0.15958, which is very similar to the 0.18315. Okay, so and then when I compared tuner setting three to one, that also had a statistically significant difference. So um, it turns out that um, the tune window, because of that barometric pressure drop, um, had sort of shifted over this way. So I wasn't able to get the precision that I thought I can get from setting three, and it sort of shifted this way, and one sort of turning it to one brought it back in tune. Coincidentally, turning it to one actually turns it closer to the barrel. So, um, and it's turning it to the right like this, and that's threading it in. So turning it one hash towards the barrel seemed to have compensated for the pretty large drop in station pressure. Now, mind you, the actual temperature and humidity were just about the same. I mean, the temperature was around 38 degrees, Humidity was 87% and I think 81% um, on the other day. And yep, 81%. So um, temperature and humidity didn't seem to be a factor at that point because they were literally controlled for. They, have, they were about the same on those days, but barometric pressure was significantly lower. So, um, so essentially, 
what I found was this sort of shift in tune window that was impacted by barometric pressure. Okay, so in conclusion, this style of tuner, which I'll characterize as like an F-class style tuner, in what's traditionally an F-class style rig, um, combined with a certain method of putting the tuner on, screwing it all the way towards the action, developing a really good load. Make sure you develop a, a, a good load that is stable, that has uh, other, you know, a, a relatively wide tune window where point of impact is relatively similar. Um, and then turning the tuner to find where on the sine wave do we see a flat part of the sine wave and small groups with the same point of impact and in the same kind of group shape Using that method has basically shown that the tuner can be used to regain your tune. So if you are shoot like like for example, let's say you developed your load in stormy weather when barometric pressure was low, but then your match or your next shooting episode is when your barometric pressure is high. Uh, be ready there. You may have to turn the tuner in order to get back into tune, which is what this test showed is that the usefulness of the tuner is that is being able to essentially um, combat or or counterattack, however you want to call it, uh, or compensate for the significant difference in weather conditions and put you back into tune without having to go back to the drawing board with redeveloping a load, okay? So this this testing that I'm doing is ongoing. It's th This is just the first wave of tests that I've been able to do. And I have statistically significant data at this point. Um, I fired several five shot groups. I'm just about out of this box of 500 bullets. Paul, if you could send me some more, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> um, and I am gonna continue this testing. I'm gonna be looking at you know, is there anything going on with temperature variation, humidity variation, whatever it may be. So this is literally an ongoing test. It is definitely not um, done, but the data presented here today is statistically significant and tells me that you can get a reliable tuner setting of best and worst. And then also when the weather or the atmospheric conditions change on you, you can regain the tune, okay? Um, so those are important things to know um, about sort of what the tuner can do and and, um, and and its function. Okay, well that concludes the first part of what's gonna be a series of tuner testing. Um, and I wanna send a thank you out to everybody who's made contributions to this and, and to also disclose that I have in no way benefited financially from this. So um, this is not a product. Um, <laughs> demonstration. I was not paid to do this test. Um, a lot of these components were donated by people and people made various types of great financial contributions to my Patreon, through my Patreon, um, and other means to make this test happen. Um, so, but uh, in no way am I getting paid by anybody, by any tuner manufacturer. Um, in fact, I don't want to get paid by uh, any tuner manufacturer to conduct tests on their tuner because I, I don't want to be uh, potentially biased and all that. I want to be able to uh, do this type of testing in the most objective manner possible. Um, and that means, you know, not accepting um, any, um, no contracts or anything like that from tuner manufacturers. But anyway, so we will continue the testing and see where this goes. I also have a short range bench rest rifle that, um, again, components for that have been donated and I appreciate the donations and we will continue the testing with that and also this rig. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, please subscribe, like, and share. Um, if you could please join my Patreon page and become a patron at some point in the near future. Um, I'm probably going to be posting most of my tests, uh, for patrons only on that page. Um, and probably do a lot less YouTubing. Um, so I think it'd be great if you can uh, come on board with my Patreon page and, and become a contributor there. Um, it's definitely helping to support these tests. Um, they're very expensive. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm using, you know, my own primers, all kinds of other stuff. And so 
um, there is a big cost associated with all these uh, tests. So I would certainly appreciate you joining as a patron. All right, everyone, take care. We'll see you again.